Come on, can we give God one more hallelujah this morning? Oh, come on, can we fill this place with some praise? He's a good God, he's a good God. If he's been faithful, if he's been good to you, give him a shout today. It's Sunday morning. Come on, he's worthy of praise. Well, good morning, church, good morning. I'm so happy to be with you today. My name is Pastor Christian, one of the pastors here at The Way. And I have the honor of bringing the word, the message this morning. And I don't treat this moment lightly. I treat it as an honor. I'm humbled. And I also want to give uh, some honor where honor is due to our senior pastor, Pastor Marco. Can we give Pastor Marco a round of applause right now? You know, I, I grew up here in this church. I started here at 14 years old. And God has just totally transformed my life. And I don't have a perfect story, but I serve a perfect God who's brought me out of so much. And... And today, I believe he has a word for you today. And God's going to speak to each and every one of us. And how many came ready to receive something from the Lord today? Well, if you came ready to receive, I believe God has a word for you this morning. Let's pray. God, we are hungry. We are ready for a word from you. We ask, Lord, that every other distraction and everything will, Lord, just begin to dissipate. And our hearts will be fixed on you, Jesus. God, go ahead and push me over to the side. It's not about me. It's about you, Holy Spirit. It's about you, Jesus. You speak, Holy Spirit. You take over this pulpit. We're not interested in my own opinion. We're interested in the Word of God. We're here to grow. So, Father, have your way today. Speak to our hearts. In the name of Jesus, we pray. We all say amen, amen and amen. All right, you guys may be seated. Give your neighbor a high five as you make your way to your seat. We got some great things going on. Just want to give you a reminder that tonight, someone say tonight. We have our Sunday night revival that's kicking off tonight at 6 p.m. You don't want to miss that. Of course, don't forget that we have our lead night that's coming up in a couple weeks. Lead night is going to be an opportunity to hear and to be imparted some leadership skills. So don't be, the, don't be somebody that hears all about it afterwards and later regret, man, I should have went. So you can get your ticket. So I encourage you, be there. Today... We are starting a brand new series, and I'm super excited about it. And get ready, because I believe that God is going to begin to do something in our church that we have never seen before. This is the year of growth, and we are getting ready to go to a brand new level. How many believe that today? If you believe that, tell your neighbor, let's grow. Someone say, let's grow. We're going to grow this year like never before. So we're starting a series, and the theme of this series is I Am. Someone say I Am. I am. This is where we're going to learn who God has called us to be. Right now, I believe we're in an identity crisis as a church. We're in an identity, not our church, I'm talking about the church as a whole. We're in an identity crisis even as a nation. People don't know how to identify. There are, I don't know how many pronouns out there in the world. There are different ways for people to say, this is who I am, this is what I do. And, and here's the problem. We just don't know who it is that God has called us and created us to be. So we're searching and we're looking. And because we don't know our true identity in Christ, we repeat old cycles. We're wandering lost in the woods. And we don't know where to go. And we're filled with this inner turmoil and this pain of searching. Because we don't know who God has called us to be. But that ends today in Jesus' name. We're going to find out exactly who God has called us to be. So every week we're going to hear what uh, we can say this. I am this. God, who, who God has called us to be. Just like it says in 1 Peter 2.10. Once you had no identity as a people, but now you are God's people. Come on, how many believe you are God's people today? So today, today the title of today's message is I am a disciple. Someone say, I am a disciple. What is a disciple? A disciple is a learner or follower of Jesus. Another way to put it is one who listens and obeys the commands of Jesus Christ. That's a disciple. And it says in Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus came and told his disciples it says, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, 
teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. A lot of people, um, we think that the last words of Jesus were, it is finished. But actually, Jesus resurrects and he gives his disciples one more commandment, one more final message before he ascends and gives us our assignment. And he says this right here, go make disciples. Now, anybody who leaves a final message with you, last word of instruction before they leave, that, those are some words that we should probably listen closely to. And Jesus is saying, all right, I got one more thing for you before I leave. This is an assignment I'm going to leave you with. And the assignment that he's still leaving us with today, go make disciples. So if Jesus spent all his ministry years making disciples, spending time with his disciples, and he leaves us with the same assignment, then why are we missing it? Why are we as a church missing this word disciple? You're saying, well, how do you know that we as a church are missing this word disciple? Well, there's a stat that shows, studies show this, that only 28% of Christians, we're talking about church-going Christians, only 28% of Christians actually believe that that word disciple has any, anything to do with their spiritual growth. That means there are about a 70% of Christians that wouldn't qualify themselves or, 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 or quantify themselves as a disciple. This, this, this is alarming. This means that the one thing that Jesus said, he didn't say go and make converts. He didn't say go and make professional church members and attenders. He didn't make go, go and do these things. He said go and make what? Disciples. Go and make what? So if Jesus put such an emphasis on this, then how is the majority of the church today missing the mark at being a disciple? Today we're going to talk about what it means to be a disciple and how we can start walking in that. How many want to learn what it means to walk as a disciple of Jesus Christ? Just know this, that discipleship is not cheap. It comes with the cost. Discipleship, you cannot get it at Dollar Tree. Come on, somebody. I, I guess I'm a Dollar Tree, too. No, ain't no shame. But why do we go to Dollar Tree? Because it's cheap. Okay, you can buy it at $10 at Target, or you can buy it for a dollar at Dollar Tree. Come on, somebody. But discipleship, you're not going to find at your spiritual Dollar General. You're not going to find it at the 99 cent store. The, the discipleship comes with a high price. And it comes at a cost. And today we're going to learn about what that cost is. But I believe that God will never require a cost from you that you can't, you can't give. And, and here's what he's requiring of us, just so you know. Everything. Oh, I can't give everything. Yes, you can. Jesus gave everything for you. The least we can do is give him our lives in return. We're going to learn out what that looks like. We're going to study out of the book of Luke chapter 14. And we're going to go through this, take it section by section. It says in Luke 14, let's start at verse 25. A large crowd was following Jesus. And he turned around and said to them, if you want to be my disciple, this is what you must do. Interesting that Jesus saw a huge crowd. And today, we got a big crowd in church today. Praise the Lord. We got people at home. I'm sure we got people maybe in the overflow right now. People all over, there's a crowd we're speaking to. And Jesus is saying, okay, I got the crowds. They're paying attention. And I got one thing to say. If you want to be my disciple, this is what you must do. Oh, I thought I was a disciple. I'm part of the crowd. There's a big difference between part of a crowd and to be part of his discipleship group. See, anybody can blend in in a crowd. But a disciple begins to come out from the crowd begins to say, I'm willing right now to pay this price, and I'm willing to do whatever it takes to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I believe I'm looking at a room today of people that are saying, I'm willing to come out of this crowd right now, and I'm willing to step up and say, I'm willing right now to surrender everything to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Jesus did not call us to be professional churchgoers, professional attenders. He called us to be disciples. So here are four statements. Someone say four statements. Here are four statements that a disciple makes. What, how can I be a disciple? Here are the four statements that a disciple makes. Number one, I keep God first. Someone say, I keep God first. Looking at verse uh, 26, uh, 25 again, uh, 26. It says, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. 
Whoa. That's pretty harsh, Jesus. But this is what he's saying. He's saying, your father, your mother, your wife, your children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. You know, that the people, the, the only competitors of, of, of God at sitting number one in your heart are going to be someone that's closest to you. Those are going to be the only competitors. So what God is saying is you got to love me and love me so much that there are zero competitors to me being number one in your heart. God is saying, trust me, make me number one, and I will show you exactly where to go and what to do. So when, we, when Jesus is saying, hey, everyone else, he's saying, put me before everybody. You know why this is so important? Because who you love determines who you live for. And if I want to live for Jesus, I need to make sure I love him more than anybody else. But the moment we start to love anyone else more than Jesus, we start to live for them. And you know what I'm talking about. You find somebody, all of a sudden they start liking your pictures, you start talking, and they just live, slide in the DM, and you're like, ooh, man. And you start living for this person now. Why? Why? Because they took the affection that was meant for God, and they started to steal that glory for themselves. And we start now to replace the devotion we had for God for other things and other people. Who is the thing or the person? Oh, this is another sermon. For, this is, and I'm not going to go too much into this, but we got to make sure that nothing takes the throne of our hearts in, in our lives. God is number one. So here's another crazy thing. He's, he doesn't just say everyone else, but he also says even your own life. It's crazy because you may have that handled that no one else is taking first place, but maybe you're first place in your life right now. We need to get to the point, church, that we all have a funeral for ourselves. Go ahead and have that funeral for your old life. Go ahead and conduct it. Go ahead, go ahead and get it ready. Set up the arrangements. Do whatever you got to do. And make sure you put yourself in that coffin, lock it up, and let it go in the grave. And do never dig it up ever again. We need to be ready and comfortable to put ourselves in the grave and say, I'm done with my old life. I'm not even over God. God is my number one. We got to put Jesus over ourselves. It says in Galatians 2.20, my old self. My what? My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Come on, we gotta, we gotta, get, we gotta have so many funerals, so many self-funerals that we get ready for all, to, just to put to death the old ways of doing things. Look, I can't live life, I can't live truly live life unless I first experience death. What do I mean by that? I gotta die to my old way, I gotta die to my old lifestyle to experience the life that Christ is offering me today. He's offering you life. Are you willing to die to the old you? It's sad that we've made Christianity a what's in it for me. We treat, we treat Christianity like a movie theater. We go in and we pick and choose. We see what movie we want to watch. We, we see if the, you know, oh man, what do I, what's on the menu? The popcorn's too expensive. Okay, I'll take two. Uh, let's get a chocolate and a candy. We're, we're treating church like an entertainment center. I don't really like the songs they sang today. Oh man, it's that. Oh, man, where's Pastor Pastor Marco at? We got this guy preaching. <laughs> Serious, it happens. I'm sure it's crossed your mind. It's okay. No hard feelings. It's all right. I love you. I love you too. But th that's a crazy thing that we've come and we've approached church as a what's in it for me. I wonder how our lives would change if it went from what's in it for me to God, what can I do for you? God, how can I serve you? God, how can I glorify you? God, how can I live for you? God, how can I be a vessel to be used for your glory? God, here I am. Send me. I will go. God, use me for your glory. God, it's not about me anymore. I, I crucified my old self. God, it's all about you. So it don't matter what happens. It don't matter what the schedule is. It's not about me. It's about Jesus Christ. When I follow Jesus, what I'm saying is I'm letting him lead me. I don't want to be at the driver's seat of my own life. Somebody know, we made some decisions that got us caught up and got us in bad situations. Anybody like me? That you made some decisions in your life that messed some things up. That's okay. Welcome to life. 
That's what we do. We're professional messer uppers. God comes in, he cleans up our mess, but the moment we try to take the wheel again, we're heading in a different direction, and God is saying, go ahead and just scoot over. Let me take the driver's seat one more time, and let me show you exactly where I'm calling you to be. And the only way we can do that is if we're willing to die to our own selfish ways. Someone in here has to kill their inner pride. Someone in here has to kill your unforgiveness. Uh-oh. Someone right, and here, here, listen, I understand. It's not easy when someone you've trusted and loved mistreated you and hurt you and you lost trust and, and somebody crossed a line in your life, somebody offended you and now you're dealing with this pain in your heart. But if you continue to hold on to that unforgiveness, I'm letting you know this. What you're doing is you're not getting, you're not taking your old self and letting it go. Some of us need to be willing to take that unforgiveness, that bitterness you're holding on to, and let it die in the grave. Let it die in the grave with the pain. Let it die in the grave with the sorrow. Let it die in the grave with the trauma so that God can finally set you free and give you peace again, give you joy again. How liberating would it be if that pain doesn't have any more control over your life? Let it die. Let it go. God will take it from you and give you a peace that you never thought you could have. It's for you. But we need to be willing to let it die. So if I'm a disciple, I make this statement. I keep God first. I keep God first at number one. I don't let even my own life go above him. He's number one. That's statement number one. Statement number two, I'm not a quitter. I'm not no quitter. Someone look at someone next to you and say, I ain't no quitter. I ain't no quitter. I don't quit. That's not what I do. See, God didn't create us to just be quitters. We, why? How do we know this? Because God created us in his image. God is not a quitter. There is not an there's not an ounce of quit in God's DNA. Jesus went all the way to the grave. His mission was to come and to seek and save those who were lost and to die on the cross. What did he do? He did exactly that. Every prophecy that was foretold about him, he fulfilled every prophecy. He did exactly what he said he was going to come and do. And it was hard, and it was difficult, and he was going to have to take on sin. It was going to be the first time the father and the son would ever be separated. It was going to be a moment that he never experienced before, but he was willing to do it. Why? Because he's not a quitter. He didn't quit on you, and he hasn't quit on you today. He's still got a plan for your life. He didn't quit on you. And because he hasn't quit on you, He's calling us not to quit on him. Don't quit on God's plan that he has for you. I heard this the other day. Someone said this. They said, just because it's slow progress doesn't mean it's no progress. Just because it seems like it's taking a while doesn't mean it's not happening. You know that every tree that was formed did not grow overnight. I think I've told you this story before. When I was a kid, I planted a seed and I sat there. Like legs crossed. I was like, what happened? I thought it was supposed to grow. They lied to me. <laughs> then I learned a valuable lesson. Of course, it takes a seed, dirt, water, and sun. One thing I forgot, it takes time as well. And in your life, there's gonna be a process and there's gonna be time. Don't give up on the, on the process. Don't quit in the middle of the fight. It's in the middle of the fight that you begin to grow and develop and grow strong roots and become the man or woman of God that he's called you to be. Sometimes the destination is not even the goal. The goal, the, de the destination isn't the, isn't the priority. What's the main priority is who you become in the middle of the journey, in the middle of the process, becoming the on fire man or woman of God. You can take a hit and keep going. You can keep enduring in the middle of the fight that you don't give up when somebody offends you, that you become more peaceful, you become more patient. You become on fire and you do not give up in the middle of the battle. I hope I'm talking to someone today that's saying, I ain't no quitter. I don't quit. That's not what I do. God didn't create us to be quitters. God to say, oh, it's hard. Okay, just give up. Maybe next time. We're not no quitters. Look at verse 28. We're still in Luke 14. It says, but don't begin until you count the cost. So what is he saying? Don't begin? That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not saying don't go into the fight. Jesus isn't saying don't begin. He's saying make sure you know how much it's going to cost you. Don't go into this fight blind. 
No, it's going to cost everything. Everything's going to change. Your life is going to be totally transformed. But if you don't understand the price, the cost, you don't understand how things are going to change, what I can do in your life, and what I'm requiring, then, in the, then don't do it because in the middle of the fight, you may want to quit. But he's saying this, count the cost. He's saying, for who would begin a construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money. And then everyone in the world, everyone would laugh at you. That's messed up, Jesus. Everyone's going to laugh at me? They, say, they would say, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. See, Jesus is saying, understand, as my disciple, I didn't call you to be a half-built tower. I didn't call you to be a halfway Christian. The word says this, Jesus says this, uh, the word says this, God is faithful to complete the work that he started in you. You feel like you don't got the material or the money, God's got it. Trust me, he's going to finish what, everything he started in you. The only reason why we got half-built Christians, we got halfway buildings out here of Christians, is, is not because God gave up on you. It's because we gave, gave up on God, and we gave up on the process. And God is saying, don't give up, because I got you. I'm going to see you all the way through to the end. If you feel like you don't got what it takes, God's saying, I got what it takes. I'll provide everything you need. I'll never call you into a battle or to a fight or to an assignment that you can't complete. I will equip you with everything you need to see it all the way through to the end. He didn't call us to be halfway Christians. Disciples don't quit on God's plan. Whatever he's called you to do, he's going to equip you to do it. Trust me. So we have the faith and the endurance to get through to the other side. Is it hard? Of course it is. Don't quit, though. Is it tempting to turn back? Yeah, probably. Don't do it, though. God is saying, look, there's going to be a process. There's going to be a fight. But don't quit on me because I'll never quit on you. I'll never let go of you. The Bible says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. How many believe that today? That's statement number two. Statement number three. Someone say, I'm a warrior. I'm a warrior. Say it like a warrior. A warrior. Woo, we got some warriors up in here. I'm a warrior. Look at verse 31. It says, or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him. It's so interesting that right here, there's a, it, it, Jesus is describing somebody that's outnumbered. Jesus right now is describing his disciples in moments where he, they feel outnumbered and overcome. You feel like the enemy is marching towards you with twice as much that what you have. It's got 20,000 soldiers marching against you and you only got 10,000 soldiers. I wonder if you've ever felt that way at times. You felt so overwhelmed. You felt like the enemy is coming at you with double what you got. What God is saying here is that I've called you to be a warrior. Not only have I called you to be a warrior, but I've called you to have victory. And if I say you have the victory, believe me, you have the victory. No one else can say anything else. Jesus fought the battle for us, and he won. Jesus never went to a battle and lost. God still to this day is undefeated. And, 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 and there, is no, there is no moment like, oh, I wonder when he's going to get one loss on his record. It will never happen, ever. God has the victory. He will remain victorious over every battle and over every fight. Demons don't even come close to the power that Jesus has. He is victorious and he is all powerful. He is all sovereign. He can just speak and things will come into existence. Just with a word, things can change. He can tell that wave, calm down, and the waves will begin to cease and the storm will stop. That's how powerful your God is. You don't serve a wimpy God. You don't serve a weak God. He's powerful. And if he's called you into the battlefield, it doesn't matter if the enemy doubles your numbers. God has a one word, can defeat everything in front of you. But he's saying, my disciples are willing to go into the fight. My disciples are warriors. If you want to be my disciple, you got to be willing to say, I'm a warrior. I'm willing to put in a fight. I'm willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the enemy. 
I'm willing to put my dukes up. I'm willing to pray when I don't feel like it. I'm willing to intercede for my family. I'm willing to fight for my marriage. I'm willing to keep going to the battlefield because I'm not going to give up. I'm a warrior. How many warriors we got in this place? I'm a warrior. It says in Psalms 18:39. I love this scripture. You give me strength. Someone just lift your hands right now all over this place. Say, God, you give me strength for the battle and victory over my enemies. Let's say that one more time. Say, God, you give me strength for the battle and victory over my enemies. Come on, give God some praise. We declare that scripture right now over our lives. That verse is saying this, whatever battle you face, your source of strength comes from God. How cool is that? That we can tap into his power. We can tap into his strength. We tap into God's authority. We tap into, anytime we go into the battle, it's, it's kind of unfair. You know why? It's kind of like cheating. Because if I go toe to toe, if I'm in the ring and the devil's in the ring, Little does he know, Jesus is actually with me. So it's like two on one. It's kind of like cheating. So there's no way the enemy can overcome who you are because you're fighting with Jesus on your behalf and there's nobody that can overcome him. How many believe that? Well, this is a scary thing. Verse 32. If he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. You know what's crazy? Some of us have had and created a peace treaty with the enemy. What do I mean by that? The enemy is okay. So this is the peace treaty that the enemy offers us. The enemy is okay if, he's, if we would do this. Look, look, I'll let you go to church. I'll let you do your thing. Let you get all dressed up and have a good time, make it there, boom, boom, boom. But just do me one favor. Don't become a real on fire disciple. Just, just stay right there in the background, blend in with the crowd, kind of become just one with everybody else. But let me tell you, just don't be on fire. Don't shine for God. Don't, don't be all serious about it. Just kind of like dip, dip your toe in the water. That's it. I wonder how many of us right now have a peace treaty signed with the devil. Lord, help us. I wonder how many of us right now have made a commitment and said, like, all right, Jesus, all right, devil, this is what I'll do. I'll go to church, but, but, I, but I won't go all in. The devil's like, all right, cool, I'll lay off a little bit. How many of us, are, you know what we need to do? We need to take whatever peace treaty, whatever demonic treaty we have with the devil and cut that thing up. Devil, I'm here to give you hell. Devil, I'm here to give you, I'm giving you a taste of your own medicine. Devil, I'm here to make a, I'm here to fight. Devil, I'm here to take over some territory. Come on. I hope I got a warrior in here who's saying, devil, I'm not going to let you touch my family. I'm not going to let you touch my kids. I'm not going to let these generational curses repeat over and over. I'm done giving the devil the time of day. It's over. We need to break all, any peace treaty we got with the devil today. We need to stomp the devil out with our own two feet. And we need to let the devil know, I'm a fighter. I'm a warrior. I'm not here to play no games with you. Peace treaty with the devil. Sign a document. Yeah, just be a happy family. Go to church, but just don't get serious with God. Don't pray for your family. Don't disciple your kids. Don't read the Bible at home. Don't talk about God. Just do your things. You don't have to get rid of Oh, man, I'm going to keep going on that. We'll just keep going. Look, church, we're in a war. We're not in a fairy tale. This isn't no fairy tale. This is a war. And here's the other thing. There is no neutrality in a war. There is nobody that could say, oh, I'm independent. I'm, I'm just kind of, I'm, you know, what are you, left or right? I'm just kind of in the middle. There, there's no such thing in a war. When you're in a war in the spiritual realm, the devil is coming after you with everything he got, but Jesus has overcome him and the world. He says, take heart, I have overcome the world. You're in a war, whether you like it or not. I'd rather be on the winning team. I don't know about you, but how many want to be on the winning side, on the victorious side? God has purchased your victory. Fight on the winning side. Come on, somebody. So our statements, what are we saying? Four statements a disciple makes. What is number one? I keep God first. 
Number two was what? I'm not a quitter. Or if you wrote down, I ain't a quitter, that's cool too. <laughs> number three, I'm a warrior. Someone say, I'm a warrior. warrior. Love it. And number four is I make an impact. Yeah. I make an impact. I love this. Look at verse 34. We're still in Luke 14. It says, salt is good for seasoning. Mm-hmm. If you're like me, I love salt on my food. Like, I, I pack salt and seasoning. My wife knows she just packs salt and seasoning all over my food. I love it. I love salsa. I love hot things. I love habanero. I love eating a serrano with my food. I love spicy, seasoning, salty, everything. I don't like no flavorless stuff. Come on, we're in, Sa we're in San Bernardino, right? We're in Southern California. We don't, come on, we cook our veggies with all kinds of stuff. We make our veggies unhealthy. I don't know how we do it, but we do it. And they bomb. Do you eat your veggies? Oh, yeah, I ate them things. All greased up, butter and seasoning, all kinds of stuff. No one likes dry asparagus, and if you do, man. I love asparagus, but you better put some seasoning on that thing. So salt is good. How many know salt is good? Salt is good for seasoning, but if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? Flavorless salt is good neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. Lord help us. It is thrown away. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. See, part of the cost of being a true disciple, part of the cost of being able to say I'm a disciple is, is making a commitment that you are going to season the world. Too many of us have this, like, a fantasy in our mind that Pastor Marco is going to come over to your workplace and get everybody saved. And, you know, one of the pastors is going to come over and preach to everyone in your family at home and pray for you every morning and anoint the walls with oil so that, you know, everyone can all of a sudden be a little angels. That's not going to happen. I mean, it might. But why are we depending on someone else to season our own homes when God has called you to be the salt of the earth? Now, listen. This isn't a message just for somebody, and I've done this before. I've, been, I've told myself, oh man, that's a good message for so-and-so. Man, I hope they're here right now. And you know what I'm talking about? You're probably doing it right now, it's okay. Wait, listen, this is a message for you. Someone say it's for me. You could be a leader in this church for 20 years, or this could be your first day. This message is for you. God is saying, I did not call somebody else to be the salt in your circle. The reason why you work at the job you work is so that God can shine in that place. The reason why you live in the home you live is so that God can shine in that place, in and through you. God called you to be the seasoning. God called you to be the salt. He didn't call you to rent or get a loan out and have somebody else come and season your home every once a year. He called you every single day to season and to salt and to be a light wherever you you touch your feet on the ground. It's sad that we got, we got right now fathers depending on uh, uh, somebody else to come father our homes, disciple our homes. Some of us, yeah, I don't want to, okay, I'll just say, it. some of us right now, we, we, we're, as men, right now we're depending on our, our wives and our women's, our mothers to disciple and to lead our homes. And I'm not saying, listen, I'm not saying a wife, a mother can't do that, but as a man, I'm just speaking to the men real quick. As a man of God, it's our responsibility to be the priest of our home, to be the covering over our children, to be the covering over our wives. The Bible says, wash your wife with the word. Cover your children. Lead them into, lead them into discipleship. Love them and care for them. As men of God, that's our duty. That's what we do. We make an impact. That's the reason why you're a man. God didn't make you a woman for that reason. He called you to lead your family. Come on, man. Where are the men at in this place? I need some men warriors in this place who are stepping up and saying, I'm going to lead my home with everything I got. I'm not going to depend on anybody else. I'm going to be the priest of my own home. It's what we're called to do. We're warriors. We don't quit. We don't quit on our family. Look, and if, and here's another thing. I, I'm just on a soapbox, I think. I don't know what's going on. But here's another thing. As men, don't, I, I've heard someone tell me this before. Like, man, you know, I, I really want to, like, pray with my family. But I, I kind of get embarrassed a little bit. It's okay. I, I, I understand. When you're stepping out and doing something you've never done before, it's going to be uncomfortable. How do I do it? How do I get in and start? I want to do that. 
I want to pray with my family. I just, it's just kind of awkward. I don't know what to do. They're going to be like, what? Who's this guy? It doesn't matter. You're the leader of that home. If you say, family, we're going to get together, we're going to pray. What? That's right. We're going to pray. P-R-A-Y. Pray. I said it right. Come here. Let's pray. Guys, turn, it, turn everything off. We're going to study the word of God right now. The word of God? Who is this guy? That's right. We're going to study the word of God. I'm going to lead this family the way we need to go. I'm switching things up in this place. I know maybe I've been a little negligent. Maybe I've been a little distant, but things are changing in my home right now. Things are switching up in this place. We're not going to be a, a, a lukewarm Christian. We're not going to be on the sideline. We're going to be disciples up in my house. We're going to be disciples that serve and live for Jesus. Come on. I wish I had two or three men that would stand up and say, I'm a disciple maker in my home. I'm gonna make disciples. It's what I do. It's what we do. Don't become a flavorless Christian. The Bible, the scripture literally says that the flavorless salt is good basically for nothing. I didn't say that. Where it says that? Good for not the soil, not even the manure pile. If flavorless salt is not even good for the manure pile, what is it good for? Look, I'm, I'm this for everybody in here. Let's not be, oh man, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna choose my words wisely. I'm gonna just say it. Let's not be worthless Christians. Look, I'm not saying you don't have value in the Lord's eyes. He loves you. He, Christ died for you. That's plain and simple. That's plain as day. But what do I mean by worthless? What do I mean by useless? What I mean is this. We're a Christian just for me in my little bubble and I make zero impact in my life around me. I hide it. I don't want no one to know. I sneak in. I blend in in the crowd. No one can tell I'm a Christian or I'm a believer. That's flavorless. There's no seasoning. It's like asparagus with no salt. It's nasty. Come on, let's be Christians that step up and say, I'm going to season. I'm going to be a believer. I'm going to be on fire. Wherever I go, people are going to know that I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's who I am. I don't care if you're annoyed. I don't care if I told you I love you. I don't care if I already told you the gospel a thousand times. I'm gonna shine my life for Jesus. The impact you make in the kingdom depends on your discipleship commitment. What do I mean by that? The less commitment you have to being a true disciple, then the less impact you'll have in the kingdom. But the greater your commitment is, the more committed to not giving up, the more committed to being a fighter in the battlefield, the more commitment you have to keeping God first and placing him as number one, then the greater impact you will have in this world and in your family. It begins in your home, it'll begin in your workplace, it'll begin in your families, and it'll, it'll begin to spread like wildfire, but it starts with you. God has called you and I to be the hands and feet of Jesus. How many believe that today? It's my last verse. Please no one leave. It's my last verse. I have to say that sometimes because some people are like, now's my time, but it's not your time yet. <laughs> Luke 15, verse 1. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. Why did I include that verse? Well, Jesus was speaking to the crowds as he often did. He would talk to everybody. But how crazy is it that the people that wanted to draw near to Jesus and closer to him were the worst of the worst people? The most notorious sinners, the scripture says, are the ones that would begin to pull on Jesus. They would come for more. Jesus, I want more. Jesus, I want more. Jesus, I want to follow you. Jesus, I want to obey you. Jesus, I want to live for you. You know what the scripture tells me? It's good news for all of us that everybody in this room is qualified right now in this moment because Jesus is the one calling you. And if you feel like you're the worst sinner in this room, like you're the least qualified, I'm telling you right now, Jesus has his eyes on you and he's calling you to live out everything here. The most notorious sinners, the people that were known for living against God's will were the ones that were crying out for more and Jesus was calling them. I looked up a stat that said the number one reason, the number one reason why, all, why so many people are not engaged in discipleship and don't make disciples, it's 
because they feel like they're disqualified. I don't feel qualified to do that. I missed my opportunity and chance. If I'd have done it 10 years ago, maybe, but I missed my chance. That's a lie from the enemy. God is calling even the most notorious sinner in this room and saying, I'm calling you. I'm calling you to be my disciple. I'm calling you to follow me. I'm calling you to live for me. And and I promise you this, when you live for me, I have promises for you. I have freedom for you. I have breakthrough for you. I have a new beginning for you and your family. Look, we were all in uh, in the world. We gave it 110% and God is saying, I want you. You gave it everything in the world. Now I need you to give it everything for my kingdom. I need you to give it everything for the gospel. I need you to give everything for, uh, come on. I wish I had someone in here who said, look, I'm done living for the world and I'm ready to give it all up for Jesus. Give them everything today. Give them everything. Bow your heads right there where you're at. Just close your eyes. Right now in this moment, if you're saying, I'm ready to give God my everything. I've recognized that I've sinned against him. I've recognized that I've fallen short. I admit it. That's step number one. You know, the Bible says that the price or the wage of our sin is death. Because we've all sinned. We know it. There's a price tag that you owe because of that. It's a big debt. It's called death. And death, what does death mean? That I'm going to die one day? Not just that. Death means that you're going to be eternally separated from God forever. In other words, it's hell. Because of my sin, I inherit hell. That's my, that's my price. So where's the hope? If all of, us, all of us have sinned, then am I just going to go to hell? Is that it for me? Well, here's where God came into the picture because of his love for you. The Bible says God so loved the world, which means you. It means people, notorious sinners, he loved you so much. The worst of the worst, he loves you so much that he gave his son. He gave his son to die on the cross for you so that you wouldn't have to die, so that you wouldn't be eternally separated from him. Jesus said, you know what? The price that you owe, give it to me. The punishment you deserve, put that punishment on me. The cross that you're supposed to be nailed to, nail me to that cross. I'll pay the price for you so that you can be free. So since Jesus paid that price, and he resurrected from the dead, he defeated your sin and death. So now what do I do to get saved? Do I have to go clean up and come back? No. It's like trying to clean up before you you go to the hospital. It's like trying to get healed before you see a doctor. It's not how it works. God is saying, come to me with everything you got right now in this moment. How do I get saved? How do do I accept that, that, that freedom that Jesus is offering me? How do I accept the sacrifice that he made? This is all you need to do. Repent of your sins. Which means just change your mind on your life and turn around and come to God. And then put your faith in Jesus Christ today. Don't go try to earn God's love. He loves you already. Just receive it. Right now in this moment, if you're ready to receive the love of Jesus, if you're ready to receive forgiveness of your sin and receive a brand new start, I'm going to count to three. And all over this room, what I want you to do, when I count to three, I just want you to raise up your hand boldly. Are you ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Three, raise your hands all over this room, all over this room. I see all those hands. I see those hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Anybody else? Eleven. Anybody else? Keep your hands up. Twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six. Come on. Twenty-seven, twenty-eight. Come on. Anybody else? Twenty-nine. I see you guys. There's more hands. Thirty. Let's do this. Thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three. Come on. Let's do this. Everybody that, let's all, let's do this. Everybody that raised your hand, I want you to do one more bold thing. I just want you to stand up on your feet right now. If you raise your hand, all 33 people that raised their hand, just stand up to your feet right now. All over this room, from the front to the back. I'm proud of you back there. I see you. I'm proud of you guys back there. We see you guys. I see you guys. We're so proud of you. This is a decision that will change your life forever. Would you do one more bold thing for me? 
one more bold thing. We want to pray with you guys. For those that are standing up, would you make your way out of your seat and just come up? We got a prayer team right here that's going to pray with you. And con Come on, let's come up. Let's give them a hand and let's stand to our feet and let's congratulate them as they make their way forward. Come on, church. Let's get excited. Let's get loud. Let's stand in agreement. Today is a brand new day. Jesus my Savior. Come on, let's sing that one more time. You're the reason why I sing. Come on, they're still coming, church. Let's get excited. Let's clap for them. Yes. Jesus my Savior. All I can say is I love you, Lord. Come on, this is awesome. They're still coming. Come on, let's clap. They're still coming. They're still pouring in. They're still pouring in. Forever changed. Forever changed. It's a brand new beginning. It's a brand new beginning. Look, for everyone that came up here, could you just look at me really quick? Everyone that came up. I just want to speak to everybody that came up. We're proud of you. God is proud of you. Look, you came all the way up here. Proud of you. Love you. New beginning for you in Jesus' name. I'm proud of you. God's doing a new thing in our lives, and this is what we're going to do. The person in front of you, they're going to pray with you. I want to make sure everyone's covered as well. If, there's, if not everyone's covered, we need some help with some pastors and leaders. We're going to pray with you. The person's going to pray with you, and we're going to get you connected to your next step. Why is that piece so important? Because in order to be a disciple, we got to commit to the process and grow. We don't quit. We don't leave here and then quit on our growth. Right now is the beginning. It's the end to your old life, and it's the beginning of a brand new one. So they're going to pray with you, and they're going to get you connected to your discipleship process. They're going to sign you up for a class. They're going to sign you up to get baptized. But in this class, we're going to teach you how to follow Jesus, teach you how to study the Word, teach you how to live for God, teach you how to fight your battles. We're going to show you how to do that. We're going we're to connect you. And if there's anyone out there who's saying, look, I need to get connected to that too, we have a website. You can go to thewayconnect.com and get signed up for it. Or you can go to our booth, our foyers, and they can get you signed up for your next step. We have a team of people waiting to connect with everybody on your next step. We want all of us to go to the next step and go to the next level. Are we ready to grow? Are we ready to give our lives to Jesus today? Let's bow our heads and let's close our eyes. I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, I give you my life. Thank you for dying on the cross, for raising from the dead, so that I can be saved. I believe in you, Jesus. I put my faith in you. I repent of my sins. I turn, I, ch I change my mind on the way I've been living, and I give my life to you. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit, so that fr uh, from this moment forward, I'll never be the same again. Thank you, Jesus for saving me and forgiving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Come on. Let's give God some praise for all the souls that got saved today. Man, there's got to be 60 people up here right now. Church, don't forget tonight at 6 p.m. is our Sunday night revival. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be a service like we've never had. Come receive an encounter with God. And don't forget, you can get connected in our foyer. And if you need to sign up, for lead night, you can buy your ticket, but buy your tickets before they run out. We still have some available. And uh, also, let's invite people to Marriage Challenge. We got flyers at the door. Let's invite friends and family to be here in the house today or, or, or during Marriage Challenge starts. We love you, church. God bless you. Remember, if God is for you, there is no one who can come against you. If we need prayer coming up, I'd love to pray with you. God bless.